I think maybe one of the most often quoted verses for people that are facing the unknown is Jeremiah 29, 11. And it makes sense. I mean, who doesn't want to know that God has plans for their prosperity? Let's read this verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now let's slow down really quick and just ask this question, like what does this verse actually mean? So let me just start about my situation, like how I read this verse. So, so when things are not going our way, not going my way, when we face hardships or rejection, when I face hardship or rejection, Jeremiah 29, 11 is often a favorite verse that very well-meaning and good intention friends will send to me that it makes sense. Like, I love this verse, right? And here's what I feel when I read it. Like, don't worry. Like, God's got me. Like, I just need to remind myself of Jeremiah 29, 11. I need to claim Jeremiah 29, 11 as my promise, my personal private promise from God. God is going to work out my pain and he's gonna turn it into prosperity. Like who wouldn't want this to be true of their lives? Now I wanna point out that in a sense it is true, but we have to be careful that we don't demand or we don't um, try to force whatever that sense is to be our sense of it, our context of it, and we're rather open to the way that God intends for this verse to be read. So let's start here. Let's start with the historical context of Jeremiah 20 and 11. The book of Jeremiah is in the Old Testament, and this verse is actually written to the people of Israel. Um, and it's used as a promise from God uh, to let them know, to be encouraged that the bad that they're experiencing in that time is going to be turned around. And so again, let's relate it to our situation. Like we may feel like we are having a bad day or we're dealing with a tragic health issue or relationship challenge. And, and so in the same way, maybe that it was for the ancient Israelites, it could be the same for me. Like Jeremiah 29, 11, it's the answer to our present pain with a future promise of prosperity. It's so simple, right? Well, not exactly. Again, here's the course correction. When we read the Bible, we need to remember that the Bible has a divine author, God, who works through human authors. Because God has chosen to work through time and space, the human authors are actually writing with an immediate audience in mind. In a way, we can say there are actually two audiences. The original audience that would have been the first recipients of the biblical text and the audience of the church, past, present, and future. This is actually pretty miraculous. With this established, I just want to suggest that we have to separate in scriptures what is a policy from what is actually a principle. A policy deals with something that is direct, it's a command, it's an imperative. It's meant to be taken literal and to a very specific person or to a group of people. A principle refers to eternal truths or wisdom that represent the characteristics of God to his people across the generations. They speak to general truths that are important for all believers across all time and space that we really need to be aware of. Jeremiah 29.11 was a policy for the original audience. The people of Israel were in Babylonian captivity. They were under oppression and they longed for the promise, future of restoration that God had given to them. So the plan to prosper for the Israelites was located in a very specific historical situation with expectations of the Israelites to return to a physical Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah 29 11 holds immense principles for us today. You and I are not under Babylonian imprisonment, but we are facing the impact and the consequence of sin in our world. Today, we long for rescue and the final return of the King, Jesus. And in a sense, things are much better for us because the fulfillment of God's promise to the Israelites was actually fulfilled at the cross. So here's an idea. Number one, our prosperity or our good fortune is actually found in the salvation we receive from Jesus. And number two, our hope is a past accomplishment, the cross, that anchors our confidence in the future fulfillment of Christ's return, when he's going to make all the wrong things right. And number three, our future. It's the reality of the new heavens, the new earth. It is a return to Eden that's now no longer a garden, but is a garden city, as the book of Revelation teaches. So how should we not read Jeremiah 29, 11? Well, not as a policy. Why? because this promise was given by God to a specific people. So how should we read it? As evidence of the principles of God's kindness 
his compassion, and his faithfulness towards all his children in all of human history.